Okay, so uh, let's uh, start. So I can move. Yes. So the first question is obviously why do you want to learn C? So this is uh, a plot that I update uh, every year, which is uh, which is the POV ranking. So that's basically a way to tell you how much not really popular a code is, but how much help you can find online, how much documentation you can find online and stuff like that. So it's not about the code which is the most written, the most used. It's not really uh, I mean, how much documentation you have, but it's really on website like uh, Stack Overflow or all those websites where you can get help, how much easy it is actually to get help on that. So it's a, a bit the popularity of the code, but you no, know, quite a weird ranking. But that really, really, how much easy it is at the end of the day to, to learn the code, and how much help. And if you have an issue, you basically type on Google. And if you are in the top of those rankings, you're pretty sure with all your answers there uh, immediately. So, as you can see, uh, so the C curve is, uh, is the blue one. And actually, did I? Yes, I did it. Uh, and then basically, since a year, C is actually the number one. I mean, it has been. Top two basically since 2002, so uh, since, uh, since a while, uh, but since basically a year, but also from, from period in the past, C is always a number one or number two. So that's, of course, a quite popular um, code. You see, this ranking is always a bit weird because some websites go down, suddenly some the, the rankings go down. Obviously, it's related to the number of pages available uh, on the web. So if a website suddenly closes, the ranking can change. Uh, Quite dramatically, which is what happened in our case. But in terms of C being number one, if you look at the top five, so the first one is C, the second one, this year is actually Python, Java drops, it was number one for a very long time, now it's number three. The fourth is C, and then the fifth is C sharp. So only from the name you realize that C is, of course, an extension of C, and C sharp is also an extension of C. So that's I really give you how much important C is. And in terms of that, Python is actually a wrapper around C. Everything that you do uh, behind the hook of Python, that gives you a nice interface, extremely powerful stuff. But at the end, when you have a for loop, uh, I mean, a uh, uh, comprehensive loop, let's say, in Python, on the, behind your back, in a way, it's convert that to a C code that's fun. So Python itself is really a C code at the end of the day. Much more convenient, much more easy. Uh, you will see that C is a low level language, while Python is a high level language. So uh, C is very basic in a way, but that's really the basic output here. So this is actually the second year only where we make a, a lecture dedicated on C. Typically, it's part of the C lecture. So we, we're seeing all those concepts, but really part of the C concept. So we split it uh, since two years simply because of CUDA. So if you in two words, CUDA is for GPU, and the CUDA syntax is very close to the C syntax. So that's why we prefer. let's separate uh, the C lectures from the C lectures. So, my point for um, the C lecture is really to make you learn C or the syntax. And I really assume that you basically have kind of zero understanding of what uh, language is doing. So, I'm really low level. So that you can really see the syntax and all the concepts in your syntax. That's perfectly low level. This afternoon, uh, I will move up to C. There, my focus is not that much the syntax anymore. It's really how, what is uh, object oriented programming. So that's what is the program of this afternoon. And therefore, the, I will go, I mean, assuming that we understood everything here, which is a big assumption, obviously. But I will go really to try to. Uh, explain you what is an object, what is a class, and that's the, uh, the purpose of this afternoon. So for today, uh, with more in details, all the stuff that we are going to see is with the basics of C, uh, and in some introductions, the typical example for all language, the hello world, maybe telling you the okay, of print statement and how to compile code, what are the variables, what are the array, I, I will spend quite a lot of time, I guess, here to explain you what are pointer and address, Always something quite difficult. Uh, then functions, if statements, and then moving to more advanced stuff, which is uh, data structures, which is the starting point for what is coming from this afternoon, and the dynamical memory. Or you can, on the flight, say, I need more memory, or I need to free that memory. So that gives you more flexibility. 
And as I said, at that new three class and object C plus plus and this concept of generic, and that's allow you to go in a much, much easier way, I would say, than about to repeat yourself for quite a lot. So C language, what is a C language? Uh, I can go, of course, Wikipedia and uh, you can read it yourself. Uh, what is interesting here is this by design C provides constraints that map very efficiently, that's the word, to machine instructions. So why C is interesting is because C doesn't have that much feature in itself, but it has feature that correspond really in a way that can easily be translated to instructions for the machine. And therefore that's a very efficient way to do that. Of course, the more abstractions you have, if you go to C++, you have a lot of abstractions, it's very convenient for us as programmers, and C is a bit boring on that point of view. But then if there are so many abstractions, then that means the, the code that is going to be executed will not be as efficient because you say, oh, I cannot come optimize this because in, in some weird case, this can happen and stuff like that, and then the code cannot be optimized as much. So of course, the more freedom as the programmer, in some sense, the less efficient the code is. This being said, it's important to realize that the most important point is to that your code is written efficiently. And in C++ and in, in, a, in a lot of language, a lot of stuff are written for you. And as I said, I'm always a bad programmer. And if I need to do a, you know, simple algorithm, I will typically not find the optimal algorithm for that. So if I can find a library in C++, in Python, in any language, which is typically high level and has all those, I mean, all those functions are already ready for me, first, I'm much faster to go that because I just need to import that library, I pull that library and I'm done. So it's much faster for me. But typically my code will run also faster because that's an expert that has written that library. And if I don't have to write 500 lines of C for doing that, it's of course much more efficient. So the fact that C is much more faster than C++ is completely true if you have the same code and basically then the compiler would do a better job in C than on C++. So what is typically important as scientists is with the, the full algorithm, let's say, and how you scale that. And then typically I would say that C++ or Python or stuff like that is typically faster in practice than C. But now if you really want the fastest code possible for your applications, then you need to go to C, obviously. And to do that, you need to see. So this is for the story. Um, I'm writing a code in, for the physicist, and at the beginning, the code was in Fortran, which is basically like C, a very low-level language, so that can translate very efficiently to instructions for the CPU. And then we move to Python. And then, of course, Python is not combined, so you expect that Python will be much, much slower, and then the speed was already a problem for Fortran. It turns out that Python was something like 10 times faster than Fortran at the end of the day. Just because we didn't have to reinvent the wheel and we can use library that was completely optimized and actually we can see in that case. So that's actually, when you say about speed between language, it's always a bit touchy. That really depends actually on how you write your code. And typically, as scientists, I would say, don't try to reinvent the wheel, which is basically what I will learn you how to do uh, during this full day, actually. But it's really important that you use the dedicated library that exists uh, around the world, and that typically include it, and you just have to make include blah, 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 and then you have those functionality available for it. Uh, yeah, let's cover everything here. So let's start by the most simple example, which is always the same for all uh, language. Uh, as I said, all examples are actually in the table available on Indico so that you can use if you want to have all, everything on your laptop, for example. Uh, otherwise, as I said, there's always a link on each page. I don't know if I, no, I can click on it uh, here. So if you click that to arrive on the web page, or you will have those on a button run and you can execute the code as well. Uh, okay, so let's. Uh, so that's all you can basically do the same exercise, uh, I would say live, and we try to give you at some point some time so that we have also more time to do exercise in that. Uh, but let's discuss uh, this example. So the first line, uh, is actually this one in green, I'm not sure how 
what we able to see here, which is just a comment. So is as a syntax, a double slash, that means comment, uh, as in any language, that's a code is not written for computer, it's first uh, internet for other people to read. As you will see at what I will not be, I mean, I will not include that much comment uh, actually in the code here, uh, but typically it's really important that you put a lot of comment because the first line of the program is typically explaining what the program is going to do. So that doesn't do anything. Uh, you can also, if you want to block comment, do slash star, then any number of lines that you want, then star slash to say, okay, that's a block comment, and it can be three lines, five lines, uh, ten lines, whatever. So the second one is include stdio.h, and that includes some library. What it means is that, as I said before, the first thing to do is to not invent the read, and you don't want to basically code instructions to how to print screen or, or whatever. You basically want to use what is uh, existing. And this library is the STD for standard IO that means input output and .h that's a convention uh, for the file. And that basically include you all the functions needed uh, to print and also get input actually, even if I didn't put any example of that. So that's basically including a part of the C code inside your program uh, and that extend basically the possibility that you uh, can do in practice if you don't include any of those lines, you cannot do that much. Then you create your main program. So the main program always returns an integer. So that's why it's an int, that's the output of your program. And then this is the main program connection, it's main, and in this case, there's no argument. This case, there's no argument. Next, you have some, some curly bracket that say, my main program starts here and finishes here. Uh, so do you know what int mean? So you, you might have seen that. I don't, I don't know if you have uh, discussed that actually in the Unix lectures. But in all Unix code, it, there is always a number. When you execute something on your terminal, there is always a number saying if what is the status of the previous code. So if you run ls, you have actually ls say, oh, I'm returning either 0 or 1 or another number. Actually. And 0 means that everything was fine. And any other numbers mean there was an issue. So in this case, I didn't specify, but I could add it would be better programming, let's say, to add return zero, saying, oh, my code reached the return line, and then it's done, it's return zero. And that's if you have an issue, for whatever reason, you say, oh, okay, return one, return two, return three, and that's the information that other code can take and then react accordingly. Like if you have permission server, you can return a number, and therefore the, the code will just be above, say, oh, that's a permissions error. Can I change the permission so that it's not an issue anymore? Stuff like that. So that's why typically all code, I mean, all code has to return an integer, and the default is returning zero. So, and I'm not going to. So, this is the syntax also for functions, and we'll see it uh, later again. And then we have a simple print x statement, which is simply printing on the screen, and then it's the string. It's a double quote. Simple code will not work uh, in C. And then one thing which is uh, important is the semicolon, uh, which is quite annoying, I would say, for me, but okay. I will forget using my example, uh, if I edit the code, I will tend to forget them. But in C and C, each time you end the line, you need to put a semicolon to say, oh, that's another instruction. So this is not uh, the normal return line doesn't work. You need to be able to say, here's the end of my instructions and start a new instruction. And you will see quite often, I guess in my demo, that I forget to put them and it doesn't compile. And okay, you edit the code. It's very simple to, to spot that because the compiler tells you quite quickly, or you forget the semicolon there. Uh, I'm not sure why we really did it, but okay. Um, but that's really important to really know in code. So let me run this. So, yes. So I'm opening the file. So I've already opened the table. Oh, you can see that much. So I'll open it. Ah, that doesn't work. You can do it here. Yes, here you can see. So, 
and you don't see the first column at least here in, uh, in the room, but there is a curly bracket here to close it, obviously. So this is a command. Uh, here I put the, a block command. Again, I uh, can try to do that. Yes, this is not. Yes. So here I put a block command, a multi line command, and here I will add a return statement. The color to be more knowing than anything. So now the next question is, of course, how do you compile the code? So one easy way. One easy way is to make and then the name of the program. So that's the same name as the file. So uh, make hello world. And then the make file, uh, I mean, the make program actually, will automatically know uh, what is the command to do. In this case, it says, uh, you know, actually from the extensions, the C, that you need to use CC, which is a C compiler, then the name of the file that you just written, and then minus one, and you put the same way. So that's make is typically know very well which compiler to use for a given file. But that's, of course, it's based itself on the extensions. And as you know, in, in Unix, you can put any extension that you want. But if you use uh, hello world, blah, blah, of course, the make will not help you. But that's a very simple way to know and, and to type I think something much more quicker than this one. We'll see that for C++, uh, at least on my Mac, it will, this line will not always work, uh, simply because uh, the, the Mac is not yet up to date with all C++. Uh, we we'll see that this afternoon. But that's typically for basically any language um, this can typically work very well. I know I can run that. That's slash hello world, and then I'll save my live stream uh, hello world. And if I do my int dollar point mark, so this gives you the value written by this program, zero, that means my program finished correctly. So that's just to explain why I put. It on one, if, uh, it on zero, and if I want to change that, and instead telling the code that there's an issue, I can return one, saying, "Oh, the principle you are not supposed to pass in that part of the code." I can recompile. I can execute, and now the return status of this program now is in one. So that can be used by other programs to check that, okay, that code comes correctly or not, which is nothing specific to see or see. Okay, any questions on this simple example? No. Ah, no, it's not in full screen, I can Remove it, okay. Uh, yeah, no, Um, let's try another trick then.
Bir dakika doğru. Okay, we'll see if no nice display. Um, so yeah, to compile code, I will show you. You can say make it's no uppercase uh, here actually. Make itself, as I said, it's not a compiler, but just uh, an easy way basically to organize or to compile stuff, and that's very practical to split your extensions. Uh, if you run on clusters, um, then you typically know need to load your compiler first. So on all CC cluster, you can do module load GCC or module load FOSS, and then you will have a, a C++ compiler. Yes? OK, um, I will finish this slide and then uh, I will take a look. Uh, you can execute by hand uh, the command, obviously. So CC minus load, executable name, and then the input, that exactly what make is doing. Uh, and then, of course, for those sessions, you have also all the web interface that you can use. Uh, so there's a question. Um, if not for the C++ compiler online, how do you run simple C code on a computer? But well, that's basically this. I'm not sure I feel I already answered the question. So on my computer, I mean, I'll show, just show you an example. But if you, of course, you need to have a C compiler installed on your computer first, uh, which is not default on Mac, for example. Um, I guess default on most Unix. Uh, but on Mac, you need to install it. Um, Either GCC or default. Uh, I typically, oh no, I think on Mac you have CLAN by default, but you might need to activate uh, uh, Xcode uh, terminal interface, or I don't remember exactly the name uh, on Mac. Although I did, that's quite common. Yeah, perfect. Okay. So now we have a print statement. Uh, I said I uh, will do extremely basic, uh, assuming that you don't know anything about compiling. And what you can do now is actually a lot of stuff already. But those stuff are mainly not that much computing, but mainly movie style, I would say. So what you can do, you can put a, a lot of print statements. And in this example, and that's an example I will keep uh, a bit for a while. Uh, that's just because my kid is now learning about multiplications. And therefore, uh, this is a small example where you just print some uh, table of multiplications. But you see, this code is uh, perfectly fine in a way that's in a way like a movie, right? You have made all the daily computing uh, in front, and then you, just, you pass the movie to a lot of people, and then you just display information, which means display line by line. Uh, in this case, the multiplication could be to do this, obviously, but in a movie, you have all those uh, special effects that are done once and for all. So this is perfectly fine. Obviously, what is annoying with this is that if you need to modify anything, I mean, if I want to move not the table of multiplication of five, I need to modify one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Would it be a step actually? I need to modify eleven lines if I want to change the table of multiplications, uh, which is a bit not that uh, efficient. Let's say. So what I can do is to use a variable. Obviously, so here I need to learn two syntax. The first syntax is how do you define a variable? So here I need to define I define a variable i, that's a name, so that I can each time there was a file before I can just replace it by i. That's very practical. But I need to specify how much space basically it takes in memory. So I need to say that's an integer. That's an information for the code to say how much memory do I need to reserve for that variable. So if you know a bit Python, Python doesn't specify variables by saying which type they are, which is a bit different between uh, C and Python, for example. The advantage is to say, oh, that's an integer. That's a low basic to say, that's the exact amount of memory I will need in the code. While Python basically assign a lot of memory even for Boolean, actually, because they, they don't know that the Boolean will stay a Boolean for the full span of the code. So Python typically takes a lot more memory uh, 
then you see code simply to see code say, oh, that's an integer, so I, I need exactly that number of bytes instead of memory. So those days on laptop or desktop, there's a lot of RAM, so memory is not a big issue, depending on the size of the code, obviously. Uh, but if you want to go to, uh, to GPU, the memory is a huge issue because we have very, very uh, limited amount of memory available on GPU. Uh, the total memory is quite large, but there are so many threads that the pressure of memory is extremely large. In GPU. So that's one of the reasons that it's important to say, okay, that's an integer, and that's as an initial value of five. Uh, in this case, the value of five will stay for all the code, but in principle, you see later that it can change. Uh, yes. So the second uh, syntax that we discover in some sense here is this percent D. So in the way to print an integer, you need to say in the printf command, I need to pass, I will, I'm going to print an integer here, and that's the D that's saying a digit, that's why it's an integer. Uh, and then it late after, you put a comma and you say, okay, that's the value of the integer we're going to pass. Then it's uh, I and I here. So it means five times one equals five. So in this case, it will be five times two. And it's here are two multiplications, so we do it automatically for us. So it's two syntax in some sense to remember from here. For the printf, you have this percent D, and then you have here the most important one, the variable definitions, int I equals five. So let's go to the code. Well, yes, perfect. So, yes. Uh, let's see, so the audience the issue with the color. Um, Can you bring the background on the left? Oh, that's my help. Uh, but then, this. Yes, let me do that here. Otherwise, I can try with the eye. Let's do this one. Color. Let's see if this works. It's okay, it's better. Yeah. yeah. Otherwise, I can try with VI actually. I do VI multiplication table. It's black and white here. Which may be better. Which one you prefer? This one? Okay. Now we make it. Yeah, so that's the, the same code you have seen. So the integer functions here, the print f. Uh, what is important? I mean, it's not that important at this stage. Is that all those space are, of course, not that important. So you can put the space or not. Uh, I don't know the C official uh, reference to say, oh, what is the best code style for C? Uh, but typically putting uh, space around the equal make more sense. Um, I mean, typically the more space you put, typically the more readable is your expression, obviously. So it's better to put them. But if you put like this, I equal five without a space, the code will not complain. Uh, and it's not that unreadable, let's say. But typically it's better, of course, to put more space just for yourself to have the code a bit more readable. Um, and that's it. So let's Compile this, so make multiplication table var. Again, the same uh, line as usual. And then I can execute intervals and a beautiful table of multiplications that I can show to my kids. So not that great so far, obviously.
Okay, so to do a bit better, we obviously need loop. Uh, and I will start with the while loop. So the while loop in this case, I have a certain variables. So I have my variable i, which is I'm using for the first thing statement. And then I define a second variable j with a while j uh, smaller than 11. So I will start at one. And when j is going to be equal to 11, I'm going to stop this loop. And then I'm editing j equal j plus one. And each time I'm making the two statements. So that's basically the same code as before. I mean, the same output, obviously. Um, but now basically it's much more readable and much more maintainable, let's say, simply because I don't have to write all the time the same stuff. And if I want to change my table of replications, I can change this number. If I want to change how many number I'm finished, I'm printing with, I can change this number or this number. And then it's much more manageable, obviously. So that's the advantages, I guess, you know, uh, what is a while loop, but that's basically how you do it. Uh, let's see. So just for the demo. Yeah, I please change the, the code com uh, slightly compared to what is written on the slides. Uh, so here I define two variables, one i and one the variable where to stop. I put 10 to stop, so I, I put a smaller or equal rather than a smaller here, uh, and then otherwise it's the same. Okay, here I should put the i actually. Although it doesn't make that much sense. Even if it's not wrong, can I, I can put six and let's put 20 here. And I can compile again. I might be able to so there's of course different type uh, of uh, loop. Okay. So the most common loop uh, in C and, and C++ uh, is, is the for loop. Uh, and that's a, a bit an interesting one. So it has a weird construct, uh, which I found very powerful. And then, uh, that is, for example, a, a syntax that doesn't exist uh, in, uh, in Python. It's a, a pain sometimes, actually. So in the for loop, you have three arguments, let's say. So we have first, what is the initializer? So when you start the loop, you're going to define a variable j, which is initialized zero. You're going to run the loop up to the time that j is smaller than 10. Uh, I could have put an equal here, maybe smaller or equal to 10. And then you are going to do oh, something at zero. Okay? And then each after each loop, you add basically one element. So j plus plus is the equivalent of g, j equal j plus one. I didn't go through the section on that. I should have. This expression, of course, is not a mathematical expression, it's an assignment. We say replace the value of j by this. It's, nothing, it's not a math expression, it would be wrong in mathematics, obviously. So it's really not taking the equal, like an equality operation or a test. It's really saying on this variable, I change the value and I do this value. And this is a shortcut for the exact same expressions. They change the value of j and add one to it. So if it was five, uh, one, put, uh, replace it with two, if it was two, put three, and so on and so on. And now I print this. Uh, so here, of course, always is the same. Find i, find j here. But it's interesting, and I, I will show you that j is actually not defined outside of the loop. So if I'm doing a print f j here, it will probably cross the combined time or a run time, we will see. But j is really defined in the loop. And it's not accessible outside of the loop. So that, what, that's what we call a scope for a variable. Variables are always local, I mean, most of them at least, are always local to a part of the code, which is defined typically by the code like. So a variable here, j, is will defined inside the for and will not be defined outside of the for, which allows you to reuse that variable later and redefine another variable j, which can be also an integer or can be a float or can be something completely different. What is very important, obviously, that since you have your scope, you would 
You don't have to understand and know all the variables defined in the full code. You can always basically by knowing the part that you edit, you can know exactly what's happening there. And that's a really, really small chunk where everything's local. Uh, otherwise, when you have code like 100,000 lines of code, if all the variables were global, that would be a nightmare. Because you cannot define multiple times the same variables, obviously. Okay, um, so let's go to the example. So that's exactly the same example. I define a variable i. I put a stop value, a value again at 10. I'm doing the for loop. Oh, yeah. I'm selecting, but it's okay. Uh, when I'm doing the for loop here, I'm going from one to the value here to the smaller or equal, and I'm clicking my line. So let's run first this. Okay, uh, and then I can run it. So nothing surprising here. So now what I would do is try to print the value of j outside of the loop. I'm adding a print statement here. So I didn't mention it before. Slash n is to say the return line so that you have uh, two different lines, otherwise you will continue on the same line. Now I can compile this. And then the error is a compile time. Uh, you see that it, it doesn't accept us my lines in J is, uh, what is it saying? Saying J is not defined for the moment. So if you go back, I will still see the code. You see that J is defined here, but that's inside this for loop. And then outside, J is not defined anymore. I could define it if I want, obviously. But that means I, I cannot know, for example, uh, what is the value of J keep quitting this loop or stuff like that. That was possible with the Y loop. If I was having an uh, early exit for whatever reason, I would know with the Y loop, okay, my final value of J was 35, let's say. In this case, the four, I don't have access to that. That's a, a code design. Of course, it's also slightly depends uh, on the language. Uh, in Python, typically, you have access to those at the end of the loop, uh, even if it depends on the exact version of Python, actually. Okay. Um, let's check the code if I forget to put something. Uh, yeah, here again, I should have to go I. So I could obviously do uh, in J equal, let's say, three here. If I did that, then of course the code would have compiled. Uh, why not? Oh, okay, yes. That's another error. So here, let me see it. What I, I didn't put percent D for digit, I put percent F, which is for float actually. So either I need to fix this and think, okay, J is not an integer, it's a float, then this line makes sense. Or I have to replace this by, of course, a percent D. So let's do one of the two. So I define it as a float, the zero. zero is not that important. Uh, so it's a, in this case, single precision uh, number. Uh, and then you can pass it. So that's another uh, print statement for the float, this one. And then you have another class. And you see that I have the same variable named j, which in this block is an integer, in this Rest of the code is will be uh, a float, and that's not an issue. Uh, I will start oh, this applications for 
now the print statement is 3.000. .00. If uh, that's the advantages of the print f comment, if you don't want that many zero, there are syntax to say I want only the first two digits or stuff like that, um, that you can read by yourself. But that's the advantages of the print f is that's really allow also you to format each number, because you when you explode, that's really important. Pointage up much less, obviously. Yes. So this for the uh, completion, let's say. So there's a third loop also in C. So where we discuss the for loop, the while loop, and the, the last one, it's a do loop, which entries are the condition. So it's basically the same as a while, but instead of evaluating the conditions first, you evaluate the, the conditions at the end of the block, which means you always go at least once through the block. So sometimes a bit, uh, it depends really of the coding style and of, Sometimes of the, let's say of the conditions that you have to put, but that's enforce you to go once through the code, then you see if you need to go to a second time. Like in all language, uh, you have also two special keywords to basically do special treatment uh, inside the loop. I am making example here. So you have the keyword continue. So typically you add, add that to the if statement. Uh, so if you if you hit a continue keyword, that means you're going to restart from the beginning of the block. So you basically bypass everything which is next in the code, and you go back to evaluating the conditions. This is the while loop, uh, or also the, the while loop actually. You evaluate the conditions, and then you uh, then you restart. And the break is saying whatever you do now, you go out of those blocks. So breaks ending completely. The, the loop, while right, continue restart, basically you restart the next iterations. <coughs> so more on variables. Um, so here I present demonstrations for four types of variables, which is uh, the integer that I really, I really, uh, and I'm going to use quite a lot in the, those demonstrations. The float, which is a single precision number. Typically for science, we always use double precision, which is double. So the difference between float and double is really how much memory it takes. And as you know that if you do uh, two numbers which are very close to each other, if you do a subtraction, the error will increase quite a lot. So that, that's typically why you need double precision to have everything under control. If you go to machine learning, there are actually they even use less precision typically they go to half precision so even less than a float that's allowed to speed up the computations quite a lot and in machine learning there are so lot of dark magic that if you do a mistake when you do a i mean a computation they don't care that much they expect everything to be to basically that the code will adapt itself to those issues so typically those days i would say machine learning go to half precision why in all science code, we typically go to double precisions, and there's also a possibility to go to a quadruple precision to most compiler. So in my physics applications, actually, uh, we use typically double precision for everything, but if we have to make like an uh, issue, we can go to quadruple precision. Quadruple precision is slow like hell. It's one times slower than double precision. So if you can avoid it, it's better. Why if you go to float compared to double, um, it can give you a factor of two speed up actually. Uh, it depends. Uh, but it also depends on how your code is written. So if you written like naively, you will not you might not see anything as speed up. But if you use some advanced lectures, I mean advanced techniques that are uh, going to be discussed, like, I'm not sure exactly when, like vectorized instructions, then certainly it gives you a factor of two. And if you go on GPU, also going to double typically. Speed up your computer, uh, speed up your computations, but it then depend of the machine that you use. But typically, if you go to, um, there are typically much more capabilities on GPU to do the, uh, single precision compared to double precision. Or the also, I mean, if you take gaming uh, GPU, then double precision is typically even not an option, or you emulate and they are very slow, and then maybe you will make them single. If you go to a cluster GPU like we have here, they of course have double precisions natively, but anyway, if you go to single precision, you typically have twice the amount of threat that you can be used, it's quite faster. Uh, so that's the implications on uh, the precision. 
uh, you can have uh, letters as well. So this is a single pose compared to the double pose we have here. Uh, we'll see later that you see there's no real uh, handling of string. With double string, a double pose is basically equivalent of string, but there's no native type for that. And we'll discuss that later. And there's also a Boolean, so a true fault, true fault statement, uh, which require actually uh, an, another standard library that you include at the top of the file, like this one, uh, that includes std boolean.h. Mm -hmm. We have a true fault statement. Um, I can give you an example, actually. Oh, it's right here. So the first line is the standard one with the print statement. The second line here, this line, yes, it's a bit matter, but it's very thin, uh, is the Boolean. So that's in order to allow true false, and that's allow this line. Boolean we'll check equal not really true here, but it's just written uh, as normal here. Not that way. Uh, and oh, actually, you have it here. You can have string like this, char my string. We'll see that, that syntax later. It's about array. So it's a, basically a, a list of characters. That's the particular way that you can never call the uh, string. And then here you see all the syntax for uh, printing. So person D is for integer, uh, person S is for both. Single precision and double precision, a float, floating point. Character is person C, string is person S, and Boolean is actually doesn't have a real type on it. So uh, I typically use this string, uh, but we'll see a bit later. Okay. Um, yes. So those two comments uh, well, here is uh, a short text saying basically all the way to print a number. Those two comments are important. You cannot define twice the same variable. So let's make a demonstration, but it will crash at compiler, obviously. So even if I'm, I'm sorry. so this is not allowed. At least in, the, in C. So I define one first integer. I as uh, different I as an integer with 25. Then I try to actually define again I that will not allow me to do. But I'm doing that. And say, oh, there is already a redefinition of I. So even if conceptually there's nothing really wrong here, uh, it will not allow me to do that. Why this is for the code something completely different is changing the value of i. So this is really uh, syntaxing. I'm going to assign memory a variable, while here it's simply saying I'm changing the value, so that's not an issue. Okay. Uh, and let's do functions and then we can probably do a break. So Functions have actually exactly the same syntax as for the main functions. So that's the main block that's going to be executed when you run a program. Uh, as for the main program, you have to say what is the output type. So here we're going to integer. So in this case, I'm going to say void. So voiding this function doesn't give any output. So it's sometimes called a, a routine because it doesn't take output. But here I can put again in, saying it becomes integer, float. Um, you cannot return a list, but you can return a uh, load double, a boolean, or any type that you want here. So here, my function is going to take two arguments. Again, as is strongly typed, I need to specify that the first argument is of type integer, and the second argument also of type integer. And you can see here, actually, I, I don't define, but this is a local variables. That will take the value that is going to pass here. So first time I call interval I pass four and ten, and then table of will be assigned to the value four and back will be assigned to the value of ten. And the next time we will pass something else. 
So a quite common misconception is that you need to have the same variable name for the functions and where it's called from. Now you can get completely, they are completely unrelated. Table of only from here to here, that's completely local as we've seen before, it's a store, and therefore you can add here another variable structure or the, or the tag and stuff like that. So as I said, you cannot define twice the same variable in a given store. So there's no problem to define table of here and table of here. Uh, that's not a problem. And for the rest, the same line as before, we just uh, replace the F with this time three, but also D, table of J, table of time J. Again, like very simple uh, table of multiplication. So the advantages of that is, of course, that you don't need to, re, uh, to rewrite it in the functions again, again, and again. Uh, that's how it's set. Uh, and then the second important point is that arguments are not modified by the functions. So when you pass the value four, you know it's not going to be modified. Because if I pass the number here, nothing can be changed. If I pass the variables, uh, nothing can happen. So, So let's uh, change it. So that's exactly the same code uh, from the slide, uh, as far as I see. So now I, I define here a variable max entry, and I will assign the value 10. And define another, which is table of. So here I'm defining it in a way which is. Uh, A bit confusing. I would not advise you to do that in a real code, obviously. So you see that I pass at the first entry, max entry, which is actually the name of the function for the second. And table of uh, is the second entry of the function, which is actually the name of the first. So if you do that, it's quite, you, I mean, it's not very readable, let's say, for users. So you should try to not do that. I mean, sometimes it happens, obviously. Uh, yeah, it's on purpose, it's a bit stupid. Because now, what's my entry going to be exactly the value of table of? Uh, but just to show you that indeed, when I'm printing, I will see the table of multiplication of this number, which is 10. So, yeah, it's really a bad name convention. Just to show you that it's really what is defined here, what is defined here, completely unrelated. What is passed is I taking the values enter here, which is 10, I assign it to table of, and I'm running this code. And the same is here, I'm passing the value table of this five, so max entry in this block will be five. So let's prove that. Uh, Uh, yes, so the, for, for the first one, I'm giving the table multiplication of 10 up to 5 and 3. That's exactly the fifth one that I did. Okay. I hope I didn't confuse you with doing that. No, good. Uh, what else I wanted to show? Uh, Yes, now if I try to change the value, let's do this. So I'm adding two to table of, and then what I will do as well. So here I'm changing the value of table of within the functions. And what I will do, so here I will, just to avoid, confuse myself. Put that back in the correct order. Yeah, and now here we print okay. So I add a print statement after the function. What is the value of table of?
uh, forget to compile. What did I do? Forget the semicolon looks like. Yes. Okay. So you can see that I was asking the table of multiplications of five, but I asked of plus two. So now it's a multiplication table of seven. Um, but at the end of the functions, I forget the slash n, so it's in the uh, slash. It's indeed five. So I can modify the function, the value inside the function itself. But when I quit the function, I go back to the original value. So going back to the code, you can see here at this stage table is five. I pass inside, I modify locally to this block table of, which is now seven. But when I quit the functions, table of stay back to five. So that's really a local to the function. Which is typically what we advise that we don't have to know what is inside the functions, but you know that basically all those values are not changed and you keep your code well separated, let's say. However, obviously, uh, maybe I should do the break here actually, but just to um, mention it. So typically, there's also a way to basically allow the variable to change which is on functions. And, and that can make a lot of sense in, in some case. Uh, but here we need to discuss what is an address and a pointer. Uh, I will propose to do a, a five minute break and then we can uh, restart after that. Can I use the chair? Yeah, sure. I mean, I guess you need to put it back after, otherwise. Yes, uh, Thank you. Welcome. So let's restart. Uh, one thing I forget to, uh, to mention here actually, it's, it's not very important at this stage, maybe a bit uh, for later. What you really need to do first uh, is, I mean, with two, two components, let's say two functions. We have first what we call the signature, which is basically this. This is the void print table in int. It's just saying, oh, I, I, I will add a function to this called print table, which returns a void, and that take as input two integers. So that's what we call the signature of the function. Then we have the seventh part here, which is with definitions of the functions. And those two stuff can be separated. So you can first define all the signature of, of all functions that you're in to, to use, and then all your functions. And that sometimes, useful if you have a function that's called a function, but that function is called another function, and then the ordering is a bit complex. Uh, you can put first, that's quite common, that if you put first all the signature, and you can even put in a dot h file all the signatures, and then you put all the code in the second file, which is a dot c file. So that's something you can separate the thing to the code, or oh, there will be a function which takes that many arguments and return that from the actual definitions of your function. So this is also that you can propose. Not very useful in this case to separate them because when the compiler sees this line, he you know, you knows that you need to add that to the signature at the same time. Uh, but sometimes it can be quite uh, useful to separate those two parts. Okay, so, <coughs> Sorry. Let's go and define what is uh, the address or pointer of a variable. So, what is a variable first? When I write x equal i equal five, what I do, I will assign in memory in my RAM, I will assign somewhere a, a number of digits between zero, I mean, which is initialized by default between zero and one at standard value in the way, but here I will initialize those. Representation number five. 
But when it's really is, it is actually a variable that is stored somewhere in RAM. And as you know, and as you've seen before, that value, which is at the beginning five, can change during the program. And that means each time you write i in the code, like here, like here, for example, what the code is doing is going to read that place in memory and return you the value which is stored in those n digits uh, or integer, I guess it's eight or 16, I don't know. Uh, it will read that and say, okay, that's the value which is five now. And five minutes later, it will read that among that place in the RAM and see if the value is still five or is it 10 or is it 20. So, really, is where I think so the programs need to know where to look in the RAM. And that's what we call the address. So, the address of the variables is where in your RAM, uh, which is typically 32 or even now 64 gigabytes of RAM sometimes on, on, on a small laptop. Um, on the desktop, you can go much higher than that, obviously. But it's basically an address, which means a, a number between 0 and 64. Uh, Giga number, uh, so a lot, I mean, a very small to large number. So that's place, of course, you don't control where you put it on RAM. It depends on where something else is running or what you are running currently on your laptop, or what the amount of memory or the combined for that. So that you cannot control where that variable will be put in the RAM. But what you can do is to print where it's where it is. So that is this code. So we have a you know, new syntax. So we have two syntax here. If we want to get the address of the variables, you put the ampersand in front of the variable. So ampersand i means print me the address or give me the address of the variables. So that's the first syntax here. In order to print the value of, a, of an address, it's a percent g. So if you run this, uh, I have a, one example here, which is a multiplication table of five, and then E storing this address. Now, of course, it's completely an un unreadable address because it's not supposed to be used by us. So if I'm running this, okay, yes. So that's exactly the same code uh, I've shown before. So and person E, that means give me the address for where E is stored, where, where I is stored in RAM. And I'm telling it the syntax. Uh, I'm removing it because sometimes I have problem with my uh, security on Mac. So I will run it twice actually. And yes, it's look a bit the same every time. So of course, if I run multiple times the same code here, I mean the, the value of i doesn't change, but where it's stored in memory will change. See here it's d6, e1, c, and in this case it's 11, e1, c. So it is it's stored in two different places in the RAM. So in a way, it's probably, I mean it's not good to use this as a random number, obviously, uh, because that can be, I mean, certainly not fully random, let's say, but this number for our purpose is not something on which you, you, you can rely. So it can give you where it's on memory, but in a way, since of course, if you run twice with a different memory, you can not use really that address for anything per se. So each time someone told me about the address, from my first feedback is, why do we care about that? Uh, in a way, it's completely useless concept to my point of view. I don't care what is the where the address is stored in RAM. I'm happy that it's stored in RAM, uh, but where it is, I don't care. And I cannot use it anyway because it's not predictable. I cannot say, oh, put it at the beginning of the RAM or put it at the end of the RAM, or I cannot use that in any way. So there is no way to use that. However, but it's actually extremely useful at the end of the day, and that's something which is always used in all programs, actually. So from Fortran, C, C++, the using of, of address is extremely important. So why is it useful? Because you can ask to change the value at a given address. So 
before we are saying, oh, I have a variable i, change the value of that variable, you have a second instruction, which is a bit the same, it's change me the value at that given address, remember. So that is the syntax, which is, you need to pass an address, obviously, and you put the star in front of it, that's basically going back, and uh, we'll see that later what the meaning of star, but star address equal five means change the, I put the value five at that given address. That's what this syntax means. And that's a low you have to, to come back to what we were saying before. You cannot change variables when you pass to a function. But if you pass the address, you can change the value that has to give an address. And that's a low you basically to avoid the issue that functions cannot change their, their, their address. So if I take a, a library equivalent, so you, you have a lot of shelves, you can put a book on a shelf, and this instruction is change whatever book it is in that shelf at that position, so put another book at place. Another instruction is saying, oh, look at that book and replace that book by another book. That's this instruction here. Here, actually, go to that given shelf and put the book at that position. Obviously, the address needs, I mean, the CPU is going, I mean, the program is going to be checked that that address belongs to your program. You cannot change the variables, which is, I mean, if you put uh, 0, 0, 0 for the address, that means the first being the binary. If you try to do that, then of course, the program will tell you, oh, you are not allowed to change something for another program. So that's from security reason, obviously. So the address needs to be in the range allowed to your program to handle problems. But typically, except after, if you don't try to do that. Um, okay, so the concept of address is really where a variable is on the map. And why is it useful? Because you can say, if I have a given address, change directly that value there. So now the next step is, can I store the address in the variable? So for the moment, I just have an address. But now what I can do is also handle the address like another variable. So obviously, C is 20 types, and it's in multiple types. So if I need to have uh, a form, I mean, store a, a address inside the variable, I need to have a class for that. And since I need, I want to be able, I mean, to assign something to a given address, I need also to know how many digits is associated with that address. So an integer, a float, or a double will not get the same number of digits assigned to an address, and therefore it's important to a different type of address. And that's why we have different we need to a different syntax here. And that's the syntax is very simple in a way. You put int and you add a star. So adding the star after a class means this will be a pointer of a variable of type integer. When it means pointer, it's with the name of uh, the, uh, the type of variable, it means that pi takes an address for an integer. That's really, we call this a pointer. Um, but basically, what it stores inside the variable is simply the address. So the value before was five, that's now the address, and the name is what it is, and the type of variable is that int, I mean, the, the type that you put here, and then the star. Okay? Um, the syntax is relatively easy, even if it can start to be sometimes confusing because we have, it can be started everywhere. But so for the definitions, it's int, then it's the star. If you do an assignment, it's star, then the name of variable equal to. So that's assign at the address of the variable e. In this case, I put p for pointer and e, assign the value to. So that's the case. And if you want to get the variable associated to a given address, it's again a star and the address that you pass. So there will be a lot of star, and sometimes it can be confusing because, of course, you have also a star for multiplication and stuff like that. So that you be careful with the space, especially so that it's clear that this, I mean, typically don't put space for you know, the float and star here. Uh, it's better to let them attach. Uh, I think it's worth if you put a space, but it's not very beautiful and then it can be confusing uh, when you do. So the type of the variables is a previous one and a star. To modify the value at the address, it starts the name of your address 
and take the assignment to get the value, it's the address, and then the star. So here is uh, all of that in one code. So maybe let me explain this first. So this is the representation of the memory. So here you have the memory, and then the memory is as basically number associated, associated to it. So this is the block 1775, this is the block 1776, this is the block 1777. And here I see that I have a variable, which is called by var, which is assigned by the code automatically this block 1776, and asked for the moment of value of 25. So if I do a so the ampersand my bar, let it say foo equal a my bar, but I will put the value on foo, I will pay the value which is equivalent to the number of blocks. If I do bar equal my bar, then I will take a new value of bar, which can be the same value as my bar. So that's the normal assignment that you see so far. That is the ampersand and you store the thing for the other things. So it's a full code doing all those operations. Uh, so I first define an integer with i equal five, which is so far. Then I assign a pointer p underscore i. So pi is a pointer of an integer. Therefore, the type of pi is int star, uh, which has a value p. I mean, this address is completely random. We don't know what it is. And then I define a second variable j. Which has, which has an initial value, which is the value associated to the address pi. So j will add the value which is stored at this place in memory pi. The place of memory is the one where we have variable i, so j will be equal to 5. So, in a way, this is, a, this is an extremely complex way to, to write int j equal i. This, this could have been replaced simply by int j equal i, that would be they exactly the same effect. So this will return a five. So now I can change the value of uh, which is still at the place of i. So I could say that would be the same as i equal six in this case. So it's star pi. So with the, the, the rule saying I'm changing the value at this address equal to six. And therefore, now if I print this. I and J are two different variables. If I print the address, there will be actually different address. They are initialized first at the same value, but here in this case, after this, we see that I would be five, or would be, sorry, I would be modified by this command, so it would be six, so J would be at five. And then you can see here that all the address, and I'm going to see that. So, where is my rules? So uh, this is exactly the same code uh, as before. I'm just doing that for the compilations. Let me compile it. So you can see indeed that the address of i and the address of j are different. So those are different code. Uh, when did it start by j here? I thought I was taking i actually here. Let me check the codes. Oh no, actually I'm taking J, yes. So J indeed at this stage five, that's correct. Five, then I'm changing with the, let's see it here. I'm changing here the value store at the address of I. So that's the same as changing I to six, but J is, uh, is indeed not that. You can see that the address of I and J are different. And of course, the value store in the pointer of i is the same as this one, as the address of i. So this is the address is the value of the pointer. The pointer is just keeping that value, obviously. Okay? So this can be quite confusing. Uh, I didn't use it for, I mean, I play a bit with it here in a way that probably sounds completely useless. Uh, it's just demonstrations here, but they, Usable, I mean, typically don't use it like that. Uh, but is it, is it clear what's an address for this pointer? Yes. Okay. 
So now I will introduce all those concepts of address and pointer only for this actually. So now I define a new functions which I define swap. So here I'm doing what I was used to saying before. I'm first saying, okay, let's put the signature of the functions. So that's a function swap that doesn't return anything. And that takes two pointer as input. So it has two arguments, which is type int star. So that's a pointer of integer. And that takes two pointer of integer. And now here I define my main function and I have to define my swap functions at the end. And that's no problem that my main functions I'm calling swap because it knows that, okay, this is so it's a, the, signature, uh, the code knows the signatures and it's no ordering issue in a way. Swap is defined before the function. So I can call swap here, even if the actual definition is after. So again, there's no problem in this code to take this block and put it here. Uh, just show you that you can indeed do, uh, do that. So what the swap function is doing conceptually is to swap two values. So the idea is that I have two integer, one and two hundred, and when I call the function swap, I want to basically that the variable a will now be two hundred and the variable b one. I want to one hundred. In this case, only from the name itself, I obviously want to change a and b, which is not possible with functions per se. But now what I'm doing, I pass in the pointer. I will not be allowed to change the pointer, but I'm, what I will be allowed is to change the value, which is uh, associated to that given address. So here I'm, I'm calling swap, and therefore what I'm, I'm not passing the variable A and the variable B, I pass the address of A, that's why it's the ampersand here, and the ampersand here, the ampersand B. And now inside the void functions, so I receive two pointers in star, I call it px, in star and by. Um, I define a new uh, temporary variables, I call it top, and I will store the value of one of them. And I then I assign it top is the value of store at the position px. So that's why in star px is giving me the value at the given address. So that's what star is. So in this case, top will be a 100. And then I have this syntax, which is a cryptic, obviously the first time you read it. So I'm going to change the value at the address of px, that's this part, and then we're going to assign the value which is currently stored at py. So that is what the syntax is. Not that much clear, I would say, but that's what it is. And then I'm doing again this assignment at a given address. I'm going to change the value which is stored at py, and I'm going to assign it to top. So what it's going to do at the end is exactly what the main function does. I'm passing 100, 200. What is at the end is 200, 100. And the rest here is just print statements uh, just to prove that. So of course, the difficult part, in a sense, uh, to understand is those lines. That you need to be used to it, uh, like you play with address and what all those stars mean, because they mean slightly different stuff if they are on the left of the people or on the right of the people. So let's hook, let's discuss that. So this is the yeah, this is exactly the same functions I just described. So with the swap, uh, here are the definitions of the functions here. And obviously, I mean, hopefully it does exactly what I promised you. So we start with two value A and B. A is 100 and B is 200. And after this function, obviously, it does what I expect, so changing the value. So that's a way, and which is a bit clever in a way, and relatively clean. But you know that since you pass as arguments an address, you know that the, what you are going to do is to change. I mean, you can at least to give the opportunity to the function to change what is associated to that address. That is relatively clear in a way that if you pass, you see that's very simple. If you pass 
a value, just, just a normal variable, then you know that that variable is going to be changed inside the function. If you pass with the percent, then you, if you pass the pointer, of course, of course, then you can change the certificate value. So it's not the most, let's say, practical way uh, for reading the code and stuff like that. Uh, it, it makes the code, it is those kind of lines quite, quite tricky to understand to my point of view. But it's quite clear after that, when you read a function, you know exactly what are, you are low on the code. Okay. Any questions on pointer functions by address? No? So here we go very quickly on that because that's uh, just for completeness. Uh, that's each statement. So in all language, I mean, the syntax is of course slightly different depending on the language. Uh, you have each statement, so you have a condition and if the condition is true, you go to the first block, Otherwise, you can take alternative conditions like LC if LC if LC if is actual conditions, and you typically are able or not uh, an else block. I mean, if none of the conditions are true, then you go to this part. Uh, nothing very surprising here. Uh, yes, one thing which is not I'm missing, let's say, uh, oh, now they have something like that actually. Uh, in Python 3, they, they do have something like that. But what I, I like a lot is this syntax, which is the same as an if else statement, but these are one line, so that's a very compact notation, uh, a bit cryptic, obviously. But what it is, is you, you have a condition first, so you typically have a parenthesis, say where it starts and ends. It's optional, technically. So you have first a condition, in this case, A bigger than zero. So if A is bigger than zero, you take the first argument after the point mark, and you take two. But if A is negative, then you go to the, the second one in its form. So that's a very small if statement, but instead of having in the way one, two, three, four, five lines for the white if statement, you have an extremely compact notation. So if you go back to my example on the table of all the variables, I was using that to like make a print statement for the two folds, if you remember. Example of that. So this is uh, very simple. I like that syntax uh, a lot, actually. Uh, even if, in a way, that's not the most clear. I mean, you need to use partial I mean, if you have small stuff, that's fine. If you have big expression for those three, then of course, you need to be better or write it like that. Remember that code is for us, not really for computer. It's important. And it's different for too bad. So it's nice comments everywhere. Basically, say what's happening, but I can refer you to the lectures of um, of Damien for that. Okay, um, one thing which is a bit cryptic, uh, well, I mean, it's a mathematical, mathematical notation actually, is that of course, when you have conditions like if statement, you might have um, logical operations of that. I want to do that if this and this is true, or if that or that is true. Or if that, but not that, is true and stuff like that. So the typical N and R statement. Uh, and again, I put this slide mainly for syntax point of view. Uh, anyway, in this kind of the operator, you see, are not that clear. I mean, they're, they're coming from some mathematical notations, actually. But if you want the end operations, you need to put the double ampersand. If you want the R operations, is the double vertical bar and the not that is more common in the other language is the box bar. So this is saying if A and B are true, then you do this. If A or B are true, then you do that. Uh, and if A and B are true, but the opposite, so if uh well, let's start with complete uh, addition that. Yeah, I will not say exactly what this means. Uh, for the uh, X or something like that. But you cross that with this, and then after that, you take the bit. Yeah, no, let's not try to, to do it. So, not that much to say. Uh, one second. <coughs> so,
So, so far, what we have seen is basically uh, one number at a time. One thing which is very efficient to use is what we call array. So array is basically equivalent to what you may know as list or vector. Uh, they are extremely basic in C. If you know other language, you have typically a very advanced class in C++ with vector class and Python with list, which has a lot of capabilities. Here, array is really the most basic stuff, which is basically say, I'm going to assign on memory and consecutive number of the same type. So this syntax means I'm going to do a list, let's say a list of double precedence number, and you need to assign what is the size. We'll see later how to avoid that, but you need to define when you write this, what is the size. So in this case, it's implicit, you make one, two, three, four, five elements in your list. So you don't need to write it here explicitly. If you don't initialize your array directly, you need to use to say double balance and put a number here, say my array which is balanced has 10 elements. That's important to say it has 10, 50, 100 uh, different types of elements. We see later uh, at the last part of this lecture, actually, how to not define in advance what is the number of elements. Because a typical issue of having to define in advance, I think, at compile time, what is the number of elements, is that either you use this. And let's say I put, uh, I have a variable, which is a list of characters. But I, I said that's how you present the string. It's a list of characters. So that would be a char, and then I put a title, and then square bracket. Now you have to say the title might be written by a user by typing in the file or, or whatever, or typing on the, on the terminal. So in a way, you don't know what is the length of that title. So you have two ways of doing that. The typical way is that, oh, my title typically should be small. So let's put a big number here so that we'll never have an issue. So a typical way to not hit under the next part of the talk, at least, would say I have a title of length, let's say 100. 100 characters for titles is not too small. But then obviously you will have some users, and by experience I will tell you that happens quite often, that put extremely long title for whatever reason, uh, because they put a part in the title or, or whatever, and therefore we we'll try to basically put a title which is longer than 100, and then of course it will, it will create a lot of bugs in your, in your code. This is typically more true if you put a path to a file here, and then you put one of them saying, okay, one of them for path to a file is typically okay. And then they go to some uh, crazy child, I mean, crazy clusters where they have basically their home already in, take, I mean, the path to their home already takes 90 characters. Then you put the, the login, then your subdirectory, then you are much above that. And then one solution, of course, you say, oh, you put, and let's say put 500, now it should be cool, but you'll always have someone who's wrong. So that's the issue of having to define at compile time what is the size of all your stuff. And that will be under later in this lecture. So let's forget about that issue for the moment. Um, so here I define an array of five numbers. What is important is that, and that's completely different from C, if you went to the C lectures uh, of last week, they also have an array that's basically the same. A big difference is how we count the element in the array. So typically in Python, C, C++, everything starts at zero. So the first element, so element is actually the element in C++ zero, and it's element one, two, three, and four. My experience makes play a lot this part and that we are much more important than C. Uh, counting from zero is much more practical for the code point of view. So that's uh, very practical. That's a little bit nice code. You don't have a bundle all the plus one all the time. It sounds sometimes intuitive, I would say. Let's say the first given is zero. I would say four on this on that a bit more logic. But then for how you write your code, it's actually much more practical to start at zero. So how do you access or modify an element, a given element in the array, you put its index. So here I put balance four equal 50. So actually, I'm going to, in this case, redefine, I'm going to start with define. The fourth element is index four, which means the fifth element here. So that is modified in this one. So there's a shift of one. That takes, of course, a bit of practice to always say, oh, when I see balance one, it's not the first element, but the seventh element in my array. So that's 
And here, of course, of course uh, the source of confusion, especially if you play with both thought and C, that will always be an issue. Um, but at the end of the day, that's a low code, which is very nice, like this one. You, could, you start at vivo, you finish with a number of, and the number of elements that you want, the super smaller than, that's very, very clean. Now. So what this code does, so here it's defined a way of 10 integer. So here I have to say which, what is the size because I don't initialize it. So it's important that I put a number here. So it's 10. And then I define two other integers, i and j. And then I'm going now to initialize this array uh, with this loop. So I'm doing a for loop with i equals zero. It's at the time we define outside. So I don't have to put an int here. E is more than 10 e plus plus and, and i equal i plus one away. So that's my initial initializations of my array. And then what I'm going to do, I'm going to increase my array. So that's um, very complex stuff. But it's important that I'm starting here at zero, so that the first element is actually zero. We need to, of course, when we speak, we say it is the first element so that is has index. Okay. So yes, exactly what I said. Uh, an array of an element, then two loop with the one to initialize the value and another one to print the value. Uh, So this error can exist binary file. So that's actually, well, I've taken this uh, table from the web, exactly from Nicola Q, and it looks like there were still binary that I created last year on the other computer, actually, there was thing there. So when I create it, it's saying, oh, everything is up to date, because I didn't put the file. So we say, oh, we have already a binary, which is newer than the, the C file, so I don't need to do anything. But since we're compiled with other versions, I mean, under the laptop, other versions of the OS and so on, so I cannot execute that by, so that's why I put that error. So that's why I remove the binary and I compile and everything fine. So also, obviously, the binary can sometimes pass from one machine to the other, uh, but typically from, uh, from old machines to newer machines. I'm not sure exactly why. Principal, the way I did last year was actually on the on that laptop, which is older. So, conceptually, the CPU are compatible to each other, but whatever it doesn't quite execute it for some of them. Uh, and then, yes, I create uh, the list of my 10 elements starting uh, at index zero, uh, nothing that much surprising. Okay, so actually, I think which is a bit funny is that array are actually pointers. So if I'm looking, so what I'm doing here, so I'm defining uh, an array of uh, six elements, looks like one, two, three, four, five, six. So index zero is the value of one, index one has a value of two, and so on. And then what I'm going to do is to print the pointer of the full array and the pointer of the first element. So. Let me remove. Executables and recompile. So, what you see here is that the array and the first element of the array is actually the, exactly the same address. So, in a way, they, 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 it looks like the array doesn't have any, or the difference in a way between. 
the array in the first element is just saying my array starts at a position, so it's actually the same address as the first element. And then bracket zero means okay, take the value at, at this address, bracket one is going to say take the element at the next address. So since this octal, I guess it will never really work. But what you can do is do this. So if I'm now printing the element one, the address of element one, I'm doing this. So this is the address of the first element, the second, the second element has a very close address. You see only the, the last digit is, is four, uh, and that corresponds to the actual the size of the integer uh, inside the memory. So if I'm doing the same with two, we see that is the same shift of four as well. So I'm taking this up, put two here. Compile and then run the code. So you see that it's four here and four here, and it's the same for the rest. So, in a way, this is exactly like what a pointer would be. I mean, a pointer, you know, an array is a bit like a pointer, except that if you do my pointer plus four, you will get the next digit, my pointer plus four, will get the next digit. So, conceptually, there's a lot of interplay, even if conceptually we represent it differently. But the way it works is very good to pointer an array. And that's allow you to do this. So if you go back to this function. So you see here, I have two functions which both take an average over a different number of elements. So in one case, I pass a pointer, so in star. In the second case, I pass an array, which is int, and I put an array with a given sign, which is unknown because I don't assign memory here, which is a copy of memory, so it doesn't. You need to know the exact size and to basically know how many elements I need to average on. I put this integer size here uh, on both sides. Okay. And if you look at the rest of the code, we'll see that actually I'm using the exact same syntax. So I define a float for the average, which is actually this is bad uh, in a way. I need to initialize to zero, otherwise, my code will not uh, work correctly. I need to initialize the value to zero and to change that to both sides. And then I'm looping over all the elements up to size, from zero up to size. And then either if it is a pointer or either if it's an array, I'm using this, this square bracket uh, and I. And that will actually do the exact, the exact same stuff on both sides. And, and that means going to the next element uh, in memory. And therefore, that's why a pointer and an array are finally extremely equivalent. And it's just a way that we can use a pointer inside the functions in the exact same way as array. And that can be used for a lot of stuff, like you cannot return uh, an array actually as output of a function, but you can return a pointer. So that's a way you can basically pass array outside of a function and stuff like that. So the fact that array and pointer are extremely close to each other, in terms at least in memory patterns, you can actually say, you cannot say I return here uh, a list of flows, that's not possible, but you can say you return an in star and that will work. Uh, and then the rest of the function is the same. Obviously, this code did not work correctly uh, simply because I never average, initialize average to zero, and that's. Uh, yeah, I didn't put in this slide, I put it in for the C. That's why C is called an unsafe code, because here we are right on the undefined behavior. So here I, I define a number, a float, which is average, but I don't specify what is initial, initial value. So depending on the compiler that I'm going to use, this code can return me the correct average or return me a completely random number. And that's really depending on the compiler. If the compiler is kind enough with me to say, oh, I have a number and I'm going to initialize to, to zero automatically, or it will just say, oh, I have 
I will take what is there in, in memory. So this code here is actually not a good code because I forget to initialize the value zero. And therefore, depending on the machine on which you run and with the compiler that you use, you might get different all these number of uh, So let's check if I fix that actually in the in the code here. Uh, no, I didn't. So let's check what is going to happen. So these the, the same functions average is the same error. I don't define, I don't assign here uh, initial value to average. And then in the main, I'm taking the same function as before. So I'm taking uh, the same initialization for my array and then I'm computing the average uh, here actually. And okay, let me just explain that in that. But we see. The typo. Uh, what's going on? Uh, it's too long. Ah, yeah, it's, it's a lot of typo in this code. So this integer so it should be yes, it one. Ah, yes, let me check that. Um, so here it's complaining because I have, I have two functions for three arguments from three. So just put one. I'm not sure what I want to print here. Uh, what is that? Oh, this is float. This is float. What is this float? Ah, yes, this can be float actually. So this should be float. Okay, now I have it. Okay, and that's good. Uh, you see here that my code prints in the old elements, and indeed my average is completely butchered. And that's just because I didn't initialize it correctly, uh, as I said before. Now, if you want the same code on different machines, you might take the correct average between 100 and 109, and that can happen. So that is the bad luck in some way. Uh, and that's a, a, I mean, it can be a, a real problem, obviously. Um, is that you code on your computer, you have a particular version of GCC or a particular compiler, and everything works perfectly on your computer, then you give the same code and you run on the cluster or somewhere else, and you discover this kind of behavior. And that's typically related to, like here, I made a mistake, which is not catched by the compiler. For, it, for the compiler, everything is fine. But then some compiler will do what you expect. That means initialize all the variables not defined to zero, but not all of them, like this one. And therefore, you have completely stupid result here. So in this case, I initialize here. Compile obviously, and now I have a much more sensible uh, result. When we set, uh, obviously, so I return this as a code, obviously, because I mean, it might all, not always be a thing. Um, another advantage is uh, of this the fact that pointer array are, are very similar. Is that you can easily pass a subarray. So if you want to compute the average of the last five elements, you pass the address of the uh, sixth element, technically, and you get five elements after that. So you, you change the size here, but instead of starting from the beginning of your array, you can start basically from anywhere you want uh, in your array. And that doesn't matter which one of the two you use, actually. So that's a very uh, advantageous point. 
uh, that you can always with a, a big matrix, let's say with a lot of elements, you can easily pick basically a line or a column uh, thanks to that. And that's it. You say, I'm not taking the full element, but I'm taking I'm starting from the address of one of those elements, and from there you have access to the line or the column. So here again, especially if you follow the Fortran lectures, uh, a word of warning. So for 1D, there is no problem in Fortran and C. In 2D, so if you have a matrix, um, Fortran and C doesn't store the matrix in the same way. So that would be problematic. So that's, uh, actually, I never know which one is which. But one of them, if you do that, you have access to a line, and in the other code, you have access to a column. And that's why typically in Fortran and C, you will switch the type of index. So in Fortran, so if you have a matrix like this, A11, A12, A21, A22, in, uh, you want me to, to turn it? You don't need the remote? Can you read it now? Yeah. So in, in Fortran, you will start actually by the column. So we will say that the index are like this, while in C, you will write it like this. Where J is the index here for the column, and I is the, uh, is the index for the back. So that's uh, a difference between C and Fortran, which is important to know, especially if you want to link Fortran and C code, because the, the order in the index are different, and that's quite important to link them to the the magical way. Okay. Uh, well, we'll go quickly on this. So we already, I already said multiple times that a string is just an array uh, of character, like basically this. So you can do it explicitly, actually. So this would be a string of character. Uh, and then to say that the string end is a even character, which is slash zero, so that if you use with uh, the string, uh, the, the list of presentations, you need to add that as an end character. But typically, you use this, which uh, add it automatically for you. Double, uh, double quotes here allow you to have basically the same reading definitions as this uh, and add actual slash here for you. But that if you check the length, I mean, actually, you cannot check length of an array, but uh, you might be surprised that there is one more element, which is this slash zero. Um, I will not go in details here, but uh, there is. Not that much use on string because they don't have that much features. You have a, a library which is string.h, which doesn't allow you to do that much, to be honest. So you can copy a string, you can contain, it, contain a string, and actually, yes, you have the a functions to go basically what is the length of the string, and what is doing is actually searching in the in, in the array or in memory what is the next slash zero after. So that's what it's doing to know what is the, the length of the string. Okay, so I will not go that much into detail. Uh, here. Yeah. So, here is exactly a very crucial point for this afternoon. So, for the moment, we have seen very basic type integer, float, uh, and the most complex one is string in a way, which is a list in itself. Uh, but now I would like to basically not pass data one by one, but make them as a group in a way. So, just to give you an example, uh, for these lectures, I would like to have a data structure, so with information about the number of students in this lecture, uh, who is giving the lecture, in this case, me, obviously, and what is the name of the formation. So, if I want in my code, I, I would need to have all available to all those types of formations. I can obviously do three variables for each of them. And then define a, a lot of functions that takes three attributes each, each time. But 
but that's quickly quite heavy to A to pass, if I want to pass, let's say five informations about these lectures. Um, with an array, for example, what is your name and stuff like that, I can add a lot of information here. Uh, that means each time I have a function, I will need to pass more and more information. And that means all my functions call will have more and more attributes, and that will be quite heavy. So to avoid that, we can define what we call a, a structure. So it's a syntax. I don't like that much the syntax of structures actually, so I'm typically not using that much. I'm using the syntax for class, which is really the same as structure, it's small difference, and which is that it's a new. But in order to define a structure, you say struct, then you put the name, uh, that is a completely, of course, free uh, name that you can put. Then you have a structure bracket, and then you define what are all the variables are defined here. So here, I put a, a string of 50 characters for the title, 50 characters also for the name speaker, and then, of course, an integer for the number of students. And that's allowing now to have a compact representation of all the information I have about one formation. And that will be extremely useful when I need to pass that to a function because I just have to pass, say, oh, this is the formation I'm looking at, and passing one pointer or one variable formation, one structure, and then all the rest is passed automatically for you in memory. So this is a, a simple code here which is doing that. Um, so this is part of the code that I can define more than one data structure. So it's exactly a bit like uh, like other integer or the type at the end of the day, with a type where we can store one value, now we have a new type in a way, uh, type formation, and I'm saying variables to this to C, which contains now a title, a speaker, and the number of students. It contains more than one information, but it's conceptually it's exactly one variable, which is named letter C, which contains actually some information, some basic information, all the ones that are here. And then, as before, I can have multiple integers in my program, I can have multiple structures of the same type, say, for type of speaker and student. And here, I have one for my C lecture of today, and one of my C plus lecture today, and I can have many more. And then at this stage, you should just place orders, like, like when I said int i, I don't assign a value at the beginning. And now I have to fill that. So I say, okay, I put in C title C programming, so that's my assignment. Not that nice because I can use the copy stuff. The speaker uh, is me, and the number of students is um, 10. And then I can now print, and that's where. I need to know how to recover the detail of the information. So it's a print formation given by a, a student. And you see here what is important is the dot. If I want to access to the title of the formation, letter C, letter C, the final name, the title, the speaker, the student, and so on and so on, which we have That's all you access to what we call an attribute of the structure formation. You just put dot and then the name of the system. Okay? So here, obviously, you don't get anything at this stage. Yes? Did you return the title in for the structure? I don't think that works. I think you need to use a small copy here. Because we can try it. No, just because that's where the strings work in, uh, in C, which is not that nice. Well, we can try. Um, so in C++, you will not have that kind of issue. In other language, typically not. That's really uh, C where the handling of string is not that great. So uh, ah, let, let's first compile just to, show, to make sure that this works. Okay. Structure. So here everything is fine. Uh, no. Uh, If I do this, 
Oh uh, yes, yeah, you're right. That of course will never work. You're right. Yeah. You see the no. Yeah. So this is not all you can. Ask. I mean, this would work. Um, so that syntax. Blah blah blah. Equal work for initializations actually, but this level lecture .c, the title has already displaced memory. So this is not an initialization. So it's just a replacement of the value. So for normal string, uh, I will have the same problem. So uh, let's do main. So I can do char uh, title. So this works, but then after I cannot do title this will also crash a compilation saying it doesn't know what to do. Even with the square brackets. Yes, yes. Yeah. Even like this, it will. I mean I can try, but uh, yeah, it doesn't know what to do. So those are really, I mean, for the coins with two different types of instructions, they look very similar. It's, uh, in a way, it, I mean, it's just because it's, uh, it's not designed for that. Uh, it would make a lot of sense. I mean, any modern language, I would say, would support that. Uh, and this, that natively in the original C, you only had character, and then the way to handle the string was a string of character, and you cannot change when you have this, uh, I mean, like the same with array, actually, you cannot assign saying my array equal and you put a new array that will not be supported. You need to go element by element. So that's exactly, that limitation is actually more of the array than anything else. Yeah. That you can assign your array by block, and then when you need to change them, you need to change them value by, I mean, element by element. But, uh, yeah, in other language, you will, I mean, Python will allow you to do this kind of stuff much more easily. And that's typically one reason. I mean, my code, for example, has, has two parts one where everything is in Python, where basically you have handling of files and stuff like that, where everything is easy to handle. And then you have the part with actual the R computations, and then everything is actually moved to uh, C and, and, and Fortran. Because there you work with I mean, very low levels and, and very uh, high speed. Obviously. But handling the fact that, oh, that library is there, uh, that is the input file that need to change and stuff like that, everything's there. Well, there's a lot of string treatment at the end of the day uh, that we do everything in Python because speed is not an issue. We, I mean, it's basically handling what the user is asking us to do. And, I mean, their uh, Python is wonderful. But then for the actual computations, then we go to no object, pure C, from pure part of that, we move to C. But uh, with full speed. Okay. Uh, yes. Yeah, it's two topic. I will try to go quick. So the the, the real interest I would say for structures uh, is that you can pass them to functions. Uh, so you have one here when you pass them to function. The bad, I mean bad. What I don't like again uh, is the fact that you need to re-specify that it's not normal variable; it's a structure. Formations from being up. So we need to say read a bit like each function call that is a function. And as um, any other type, basically, you can also have a point of them. So you again you can say the functions where you have to start formation star. So you get a pointer of that function. Um, but again, you always have to specify each time you pass a function that is a structure or a, a pointer to a structure. So this is basically the, the building block that we use is happening all the time. Uh, we will not be calling structure anymore with we'll class, but that's basically the same idea. Uh, one thing I need to stress, uh, yes, so to access the title from the variable, it's a dot. But if you want to access the title from a pointer, it's a minus and then a row. So that's a big difference. So this is saying on the address, I'm going to address of formation, I'm 
going to take the title as a shape to it, and this is going to be taking the, the title. Uh, since I'm a bit late, I'm not going to show the demonstration. And the last thing, and I guess I will go quick as well. We did quite a lot for, for CUDA actually, the CUDA formations that will come later, is that make a lot of memory. So as I said, the problem with array is that you need to know in advance what is its size. So in order to not have to define what is its size, you're doing this. So you define a pointer that integer which just hit nothing. So there is no initialization. Then you define the number of elements that you want. You know, it's up to three, so that can came from uh, a computation, from an input of the user, or whatever. So that, that's really a variable. And then now you can assign the memory, say, now you can say my vector, which I return the pointer, and I'm, I'm assigning the memory, so you say which type of how much memory you need to assign to this pointer. And then you say size of size of int, which is one, three integer. So if you want float, we can say n by number of floats and stuff like that. And that will assign you a given amount of memory. So obviously, uh, so this is technically two different types of memory. So you can have a normal memory for all variables like size, which are assigned at compile time. So when you run your program, your program will take a given amount of memory and you say that's assigned to stack. And then we have this type of memory, which is defined more on the go, so you each time you hit that line, you will request more, uh, more memory, but the people that's not very really important. What is important, obviously, is that the amount of memory that you have available depends on your machine, so you and depends also everything else that's run on the machine. So if you don't have enough memory for a given program when you start, but you just not start, while well, here you need to basically check what is the output of these functions. To check if you receive that amount of memory or not. And therefore, you can handle that. But typically, you make the code crash. But if you say, oh, I want that much memory, oh, that's not enough. I can try to do it with less. I mean, the output that's adapted, the, 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 the amount of memory. So you need to check if this memory allocation succeeds or not, you know, to basically adapt your code basically. So this is a simple code where I'm assigning the uh, first three. And then I'm checking the size. Here yeah, I'm asking more, saying, oh no, I want to have a fourth one. Then I'm reallocating this vector. So I'm changing the size from three to four. So I'm basically adding on the go a, a fourth element to my array. So that's an array that I'm also, it's not only that I can assign um, memory on the go, I can also change during my program uh, to have more of basically less memory available. And then since you assign memory, it's also your responsibility. So here it doesn't matter that much. And when your code begins to the end, so when your code stops, all the memory associated to your code will be anyway uh, swapped out of memory by, by, I mean, by your CPU. Uh, but in principle, for each function, you need to be responsible to remove the amount of memory that you use. Especially if you do that in a while loop and you don't do a free, that means each time you're going to assign three, and that's what you call a memory leak, that your program is going to use more, more, and more, more liberal, uh, uh, memory. Because you if you only assign memory on the feed, then of course it can blow up. Uh, and that's uh, typically, I mean, that's a way to shut down the computer, actually. So if you assign too much, uh, your security and your program can be killed. But if it's like this, you, uh, you assign a little memory by little, you can grow, but slowly, so that cannot be, it's not detected. Then at some point you will fill the full memory of, 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 the, uh, of the CPU, and then typically at that time random effects can happen. So typically it's, a, typically it's a reboot, and then your job crash. And if you make some nice checkpointing, restart another node, and that node reboot, and then so that like that you can kill a cluster. And that's something that happens in the past. So uh, that's of course really important. If you assign memory, you always need to free them. And mistake can happen. So uh, this brings me to my conclusion. So I made a lot of quite basic uh, discussions about C here. The way to learn C at the end of the day is to take example, play with them, what happens if I'm doing that, what happens if I'm doing that. Uh, that's the best way to learn a code and all those small issues, I would say, any language at once, we need to pass the hours. Or what happens if I'm doing that, but then you learn basically the, all the side effects of uh, Stuff. 
Uh, don't forget that coding is for you uh, mainly and for your collaborator. So do a lot of comments. Uh, be careful about all the type of space and stuff like that. Uh, good structure is always good. Um, remember that you are, I mean, at the end of the day, you are, you are typically the one who are going to read your code five years from now and say, oh, I want to do it again, modify something. And if you put no comments, no discussions, that your code is basically unreadable and you need to restart from scratch. Um, I think basically all the concepts I've seen today are quite common for a lot of language. I mean, also related to Python in a way, uh, it's really important to know all those concepts, especially the one of address, um, data structure and stuff like that, that would be very useful for basically any language. The only one is slightly different is Spartan, but okay. Uh, and then we reuse uh, all those syntax this afternoon. And if you come to the CUDA sessions in two weeks or three weeks, I don't know, and then we also again going to reuse all that. 